Hi, and welcome to this Latino Ministry for Christ channel. Before we proceed to the reflection you have come to see, I want to invite you to subscribe to the channel, to activate the bell, to give us a like, to share this video, and to leave your comments. This will allow the algorithms to promote the reflections so that more people may be reached with the gospel. God bless you. In the reflection for today, Bless is the man you choose, O God. Elizabeth Keckley was a slave in Missouri before the Civil War. Her greatest desire was to purchase freedom for herself and her son. Her owner agreed that if she could raise $1,200, she could gain her freedom. Keckley worked as a seamstress and came up with a plan to go to New York City and work there to raise the money, but her owner feared that she would not return. Instead, some of her wealthy clients in St. Louis contributed the money she needed, and Elizabeth Keckley paid the price for her freedom as well as her sons. She moved to Washington, D.C., where she counted Mary Lincoln among her dressmaking clients. Without the help of someone else, Keckley would never have been able to purchase her freedom. All of us were enslaved to sin with no hope of ever gaining freedom. In mercy and compassion, Jesus gave his life for us, purchasing our salvation by shedding his blood on the cross. We are now free from sin, but that freedom does not mean that we do whatever we want. Instead, we are to live how Jesus wants us to live. For today's reflection, we read in the book of the Psalms of David, Praise is awaiting you, O God in Zion, and to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come, iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions you will provide atonement for them. Bless is the man you choose, and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Psalms 65 verses 1 to 4. Psalm 65 begins with King David declaring that praise rightfully belongs to God in Zion. The psalm begins with what seems to be a very nationalistic psalm about the people of Israel, their festivals and offerings that are made in the sanctuary in Jerusalem. But as we read verse 2, this psalm expands worship to all human beings. He tells us in verse 2 and 3, Your vows must be fulfilled because you hear the prayer. All mortals come to you because of their wickedness. This psalm expresses the universal need of the human being to come to God. All the people who inhabit the earth, not just the Jewish people, not just God's chosen people, must go to the Creator God of heaven and earth. Have you ever wanted to get close to someone to visit or discuss something, or maybe just to be around them, but felt like the person was unapproachable? Maybe you felt you weren't good enough, but isn't it amazing that our approach to God has nothing to do with our goodness? In fact, we are not good enough to approach the Holy God. So then, 
How can we reach Him? Our Heavenly Father is accessible not because we are good or have merits of our own, but because Jesus opened the way for us to enter His presence through His sacrifice. God the Father is accessible through His grace. For this reason, it is good that we define today the meaning of grace. Grace is one of the most important concepts in the Bible, Christianity, and the world. It is most clearly expressed in the promises of God revealed in the Scripture and embodied in Jesus Christ. Grace is the love of God shown to the unlovely, the peace of God given to the restless, the unmerited favor of God. In Christian terms, grace can be generally defined as God's favor towards the unworthy or God's benevolence on the undeserving. In His grace, God is willing to forgive us and bless us, all due to the timely intercession of His Son Jesus. Modern, secular definitions of grace relates to a person's elegance or beauty of form, manner, motion, or action, or a pleasing or attractive quality or endowment. The world gives it a totally distorted meaning to the word grace. The grace of God through the sacrifice of Christ grant us justice in the eyes of God. Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into His place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 2. Some well-known characters in the Christian sphere stated the following about grace. John R. W. Stott, a well-known theologian, preacher, evangelist, scripture communicator, and rector of the All Souls Church in the City of London, said, Grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. Paul Saul, rector of the Old Saint Episcopal Church in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and the author of 10 books, including Grace in Practice and 2,000 Years of Amazing Grace, said, Grace is unconditional love towards a person who does not deserve it. Max Lucado, the renowned American author and minister at Oak Hills Church, formerly known as Oak Hills Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, said, Grace is God's best idea. His decision to ravage a people by love, to rescue passionately, and to restore justly what rivals it. Of all his wondrous words, grace, in my estimation, is the magnum opus. And finally, Elaine Heath, a theologian who interdisciplinary work has sought to integrate pastoral, biblical, and spiritual theology in a way that bridges the gap between academia, church, and the world, said, The five means of grace are prayer, searching the scriptures, the Lord's Supper, fasting, and Christian fellowship. Grace is most needed and best understood in the midst of sin, suffering, and brokenness. We live in a world of earning, deserving, and merit, and this results in judgment. That is why everyone wants and needs grace. Judgment kills. Only grace makes us alive and separates us from the destiny of death that we deserve. In short, grace is mercy without merit. Grace is the opposite of karma, which is about receiving what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you deserve. Christianity, through the scriptures, teaches that what we deserve as sinful human beings is death 
without a hope of resurrection. The Apostle Paul, for this reason, tells us, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. He also tells us, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. Do you know what it means to be chosen? What does that imply? This surpasses all human understanding, all thanks to the love of God and the willingness of Christ to come down to this earth and suffer the cruelest of sufferings, to pay the price of sin and give us undeserved grace. He had no need to suffer the way he did, yet he submitted to extreme human cruelty to pay the price of sin. He settled your death and mine on Calvary's cross. Many people and religions in the world today say, this is what you should do for God. But in Christianity, based on God's mercy, that must be different. Our message to the world must be, look, this is what God has done for you. That is called grace. An active, dedicated, hard-working church member dreamed that he passed away after a long and satisfying life. As he approached the heavenly gate, he noticed a sign posted which read, Entrance Requirement, 1,000 points. The man looked a bit worried. He walked to the angel guarding the gate and said, That requirement seems pretty high. Do you think I could possibly have accumulated that many points? The angel kindly replied, Well, Why don't you tell me what you have done, and I will tell you how many points you have earned. Okay, then, said the man enthusiastically. I was an immersed believer in Christ for 32 years. I taught a Sunday school class for over 12 years. I was a youth chaperone whenever they needed me, and I was a regular member of the church choir. That's wonderful, said the angel. Now, let me see. That's worth one point. The man suddenly became very pale and began to perspire. But he went on. Well, I tithed all my income and sometimes gave even more. Also, I serve as an elder in the church and I serve on the finance committee and the building committee. I attended every workday at the church. I mow the grass and did repairs and painting. At every fellowship supper, I helped set up the chairs and tables and then stay late and help take them down. He looked expectantly at the angel who smiled sympathetically and answered politely, that sounds great. That's worth another point. Now you have a total of two. The man looked as if he were about to go into shock. He spoke rapidly with a sense of desperation. I invited a lot of people to church and often went calling with the preacher. I won quite a few people to Christ. I supported the camp program and for a while was a forwarding agent for a missionary family. And I never cheated on my income tax. The angel tried to speak encouragingly as he said, that's quite a record of good works. That's worth still another point. Now you have three. The poor man's face sagged with futility and his shoulders drooped as he seemed resigned to his fate. I might as well give up, he mourned. I don't think I can ever be good enough to get into heaven. In fact, it seems impossible for me or anybody else to get in there without the grace of God. Huh? Now did you say grace? You know what? You're standing at the wrong gate. This is the law gate. That's where you need the 1,000 points. Look over there. Do you see that other gate with another line of people leading up to it? That's the grace gate. 
You don't need any points to get in there. Under grace, heaven is free. My dear friend and brother, having been chosen by God to receive His grace is priceless. Our good works and actions are reduced to nothing without the intervention of the sacrifice of Christ for our lives. Let us leave aside our personal efforts to achieve God's favor. All that is required is to receive Christ Jesus into our hearts and accept the gift of grace from God. Today is the day of salvation and it has come into your life. Our dear loving God, we want to thank you that even though we are sinners, you have cleansed us in the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you for granting us that joy and hope of having chosen us to be recipients of your grace, your goodness, and your mercy. We thank you in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, your Son. To you be the honor, the glory, and the power now and forever. Amen.